Now, even you wouldn't do that, would you? So quit hoping that they're going to do it for you. So that's two down, and how many more to go? You can't get your bucket filled with the government. You can get the bottom of it covered. Maybe you'll have your bottom of the bucket covered better than your own. <laughs> Some of you folks say, who is this old goat anyway? Now, I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm 22 years in the food processing business in the state of Washington under the name of M.F. Combs Company, which is my father's name. I'm 22 years an officer, manager, and president of a co-op. Well, not 22, because I had to wait two years before I was 21. So I'm 20 years there. I developed, we had a dime when the Depression started, and we've developed that into an eight or nine million dollar production every year. That's what we had to sell. We went broke just after the war, when the frozen food processors, about 56 percent of them, I think Mr. Bird's I said, they were going to go down the drain, and I think we exceeded that a little. So you see, I've been on the other side of the pot and found the other handle. I went broke. And until a man's gone broke, he isn't a complete man. I got in the trucking business, and I hauled garbage. We called it produce from L.A. and that area up to Seattle and Spokane. So I was a diesel bum. Used to get a little diesel freight, a little sleeper freight once in a while, too. Then I went to Nash, the, the Harry Ferguson Company. In the meantime, while I was doing this, I was operating the Christmas tree operation in British Columbia for the J. Hoford Company out of Los Angeles, and we shipped about 250 cars of Christmas trees into the States from British Columbia, the entire, uh, all the southern end of that province. So I know a little bit about Indians and getting them to work. I went with Harry Ferguson, and I was with them for seven years when he split with Ford, and I was his product education manager for the West Coast. And I developed salespeople. I taught salespeople. I taught product knowledge. And that's all in God's name I'm trying to do here is to teach product knowledge. What is our product? Our product is a sales system. And I'm trying to teach you to learn your product, to use your product, the only product you have that will make you come out on top where you belong. This is who you're talking to, and I'm 72 years old next April. I've been with the organization 12 years. When I came into the organization, I was one of those knotheads in the West Coast that they thought was still fighting Indians. What do you know about agriculture? <laughs> but you saw Washington was the, what, fifth largest producer of wheat in the United States. When NFO came to the state of Washington, I, I incidentally uh, either quit or by mutual agreement uh, left Harry Ferguson when they merged with Massey Harris. And I bought some land in the Columbia Basin, the great agricultural irrigation experiment, where they took all the GIs off the street to keep them from rioting and put them up on a hunk of sand and said, there it is, bud, go at it. We didn't have any problems. We just had the bureaus. We only had the Bureau of Reclamation and FHA and PCA in the bankrupt courts in the sand dunes in the badgers in the leaky ditches in the dust storms you have to close the roads there once in a while you know in those days you all traded farms when the wind started blowing <laughs> and I wind up find, trying to farm half the world to try to make a living I could afford, I had 160 acres. I could afford the equipment, but I couldn't afford the land. So I wind up leasing and renting until I'm farming about 1,000 acres when the NFO came along. And Bernoff Gron came to our country 
And he talked five minutes, and I said to my neighbor, that's the outfit I want in. I've been in co-ops all my life, but I was just looking halfway down the pipe. This outfit has gone beyond, far beyond. They're not sectionalized and regionalized like I am, and I'm joining. And here I am. I want the... <clears throat> I want the notes on the farmer-owned reserve. My hour is no, just about gone. We had a character the other day uh, that made a speech about the farmer-owned reserve, and I got to read this to you. I think it's on the margin numbers. What he said, and then I, <clears throat> I wrote another version. No, I, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't entitle this as the opinion of the National Farmers Organization. I want you to no understand here and now that what I'm going to read from the other virgin, 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 mm. <laughs> is, is my idea. So don't go out and tell NFO is a bunch of radicals or a bunch of radicals or that's the NFO policy that such and such is so and so. It says here that Chicago, this came over the gin machine, incidentally. Something that sells, a lot of stuff comes over the gin that seldom gets into the papers. But in Chicago, October the 24th, and the U.S. Congress needs to reevaluate the entire concept of the operation of the farmer owned, and I have this underlined, of the farmer owned grain reserve and considering new farm legislation in 1981, according to Richard Bell, vice president of Riceland Foods, Stuttgart, Arkansas. Incidentally, I think Riceland is under investigation on fixing prices. And uh, he's one of the leading uh, prospects to become the new Secretary of Agriculture. <laughs> Bell, in prepared remarks before the Oklahoma Grain Elevator Business Conference Thursday, noted that the world feed grain carryover is expected to, to be its smallest since the fall of 1976. He got his information same place I did from the Department of Agriculture. While world consumption has increased nearly 100 million tons during the past four years. There's little doubt that some form of grain reserve program is needed, and a farmer-owned reserve program is undoubtedly preferred to one directly controlled by the government. Can you get that? Who controls your farm reserve? You? When was the last time you established policy for it? I don't like to be cantankerous, but I like the things to be correct. Bell said if he's a farmer, and here it divulges that he's a former assistant agriculture secretary. He said that the current reserve program has become an increasingly important factor in the U.S. grain market in the light of the January 4 grain embargo against the Soviet Union, but the reserve has not been advantageous to the U.S. farmers because it tends to put a ceiling on grain prices. Now, if it was controlled by the farmers, do you suppose we'd allow it to put a ceiling on our grain prices? Bell said that the release and call level should be increased from 125% to 140%, and 145% to 165%. That's your stage one and stage two, folks, respectively for corn, and from 140 to 150% and 175 to 190 percent, respectively, for wheat. And Bell said that this would put prices in a more advantageous level for farmers. I agree. But did you price it? You see, those who give you something can also take it away. The things that you earn for yourself are more difficult to be taken from you. A little contradiction here, I think. 
The release price should be well above the cost of production if market forces are to properly distribute scarce supplies along potential, among potential cust customers, he said. Going one step further, now you've you established that he has said this, that has got to be substantially above the cost, right? That's what he said, wasn't it? That's what I read anyway. Going one step further, Bell suggests that the program should be simplified if, if it contains only a release price set at an intermediate level between the old release and the call prices. You see what he said? He's got to be well above, yet he's going to have release prices somewhere in between the old release prices and the call, which is still not your cost, which is still not as, uh, uh, substantially above your cost of production. Under this agreement, Grain and Reserve would enter the call status after being in release status for a specified time period, which is good. This allows more orderly release of the reserve. Additionally, a provision needs to be developed so that reserves are called in stages rather than all at once, Mr. Bell said, and that's good. The spilling of large quantities of reserve in the market all at once can only be disruptive, and that's assumed. Okay, that's about the end of it. Now, this is my comment. To assure, to assure the, grain, the reserve grain program, to, to assume the reserve grain program to be, as it has been referred to, a farmer-owned grain reserve is erroneous, an erroneous assumption. It is not farmer-owned or controlled or administered. If reserves of American grain are to be, and we can see nothing wrong, I call myself we, with that concept, it becomes an, abs it comes an, it becomes an absolute that it is a truly farmer-owned reserve. We as producers should now begin to understand the real true intentions of our government about becoming more deeply and directly involved in the international grain business. There seems to be little doubt that our government will continue to expand on the procedures it is now experimenting with. In the last three presidents have used the embargo. The concept of the farmer-owned strategic reserve became popular under the last three presidents, and the use of the reserve has been so far to keep far below the ceiling on grain. It is demonstrated, its, de its demonstrated function has been to serve the whims of the Department of Agriculture and to perpetuate the policy of cheap, raw agricultural products. Anybody want to argue with me about that? to operate as a method of maintaining a minimum wage level for the farmers who are told that they own the reserve. Here you have a stack of grain in a pipe. There are holes drilled in this stack of grain. And when the price level gets up to a certain point, you pull the plug. The government pulls the plug and out flows an enormous amount of grain. What happens to prices? That's your grain, your farmer-owned grain reserve in operation. Who drills the holes in the tank? Who furnishes the plug and the string to pull it with? The original intent of the so-called farmer-owned grain reserve program must be to function in the future as it has in the past. I can't assume it's going to do anything different. The closer the price gets to se about 70% of parity, the bigger the hole gets in the reserve tank, and you find yourself with no storage payments Eleven percent interest, and that's modest. And finally, no alternative 
to put it all on the market, and down she goes. A program that is sold on the story that it would strengthen the producers has done nothing of the sort. It has instead encouraged the producer to make available grain to the government and the trade under rules the government has made and can change at will, both by congressional action and by administrative directive. Those are my comments. Pardon? I should release it to the press? You suppose they'd print it? <laughs> all, all that I wanted to do was lay it on you a little bit. Where's my outline? I have lost my outline. Now I don't know anything. Did you see where I put my outline, Mr. Jorgensen? I'm uh, about finished with my part, and now I want some questions. I must have, have uh, caused some things. <laughs>